Hello, I'm Giovanni Enrico. I'm a postdoc at the Institute for Computational Science at the University of Zurich. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sean and all the uh, Cosmology from Home team uh, for inviting me uh, for all the hard work in this great conference and actually also for the technical support that they gave us with, with the talks and, uh, and all the work, really. It's amazing. Today I'm going to speak about bionic effects on large-scale structure. My talk has three different parts. At the beginning, I'm going to give a, an overview of bionic effects on large-scale structure, so what we really mean when we speak about bionic effects and why they are important in cosmology analysis. Spoiler, because they do affect our cosmological inference and they can bias our cosmological parameters. Then I'm going to focus on a particular modeling of, of baryonic effects, the baryon correction model. I'm going to enter a bit of the, the details of this modeling. And in the end, I'm going to explain how we can uh, get information about astrophysical processes through the baryon correction model and what are the techniques we can use in order to constrain at the same time cosmological parameters and astrophysical parameters. So let's jump straight into, into the problem. Uh, in the large scale structure at the gigaparsec scale, we know that the universe is uh, homogeneous and linear, but if we zoom in at the megaparsec or hundreds of kiloparsec scales, we, we see emerging the cosmic web. The cosmic web that is uh, formed by, by filaments, by halos, by, by voids. And these structures are uh, typically highly nonlinear, and uh, we can model them uh, currently only through numerical simulations. The simulations are uh, relatively well understood, and uh, we are studying all the numerical effects of these, uh, of these simulations. We know quite well their convergence. For instance, in this bottom plot, I'm, I'm showing them the Euclid comparison that compare different uh, n-body codes in the matter power spectrum. And you can see they are all well converged at very small scales, k10 inverse megaparsec per h. So this is below one megaparsec in the real space. And you see like they are converged, uh, they are converged at 1%. But this is the structure that emerge if only gravity is the force at play. And we know that this, uh, this approximation is valid at large scales, but at small scales, actually, also the forces come at play. So these are hydrodynamical forces that baryonic matter feel. In our lambda CDM paradigm, we think that uh, most of the matter is in, in dark matter, but there is still some component that we can observe, like galaxies, like gas, this baryonic component, even if it's subdominant in terms of mass, can change the matter distribution in the cosmos. In this video by Lastis collaboration, I show the uh, simultaneous evolution in the, of the cosmic web. Uh, in the left, by uh, of, of dark, ma dark matter density field, and in the right, of, uh, of the cosmic gas temperature. And as you can see, uh, both the fields at a very high redshift, so uh, just a few millions of years after the Big Bang, they are homogeneous. But then uh, under the, the effect of gravity, the dark matter start to cluster, they form the, the cosmic web, so these filaments, it collapses in halos. And, um, and uh, actually the gas follow the dark matter, so get, um, get compressed, get heated up, and uh, star formation is triggered, galaxies started to form, and there is feedback from uh, stellar winds, uh, supernovae explosions, supermassive black holes form in the center of galaxies, they, they grow uh, through, through merger of different supermassive black holes, so through accretion of gas. The accretion of gas of supermassive black hole trigger this huge explosion you can see now that, um, that uh, um, push away gas outside of the halo boundaries uh, in, the, in the cosmic web. So in the end, uh, you see how the, the cosmic density field look quite dramatically different if we only consider gravity, uh, so if our universe is only made by dark matter, or also if baryonic effects are considered in the, in the picture. But we cannot model uh, uh, these baryonic effects through simple embody simulations. Uh, we need to, to run magneto-hydrodynamical simulation. This simulation solved the Euler uh, set of, of equations for hydrodynamics. 
plus they model astrophysical processes such as star formation, such as chemical abundance, cosmic magnetic fields, feedback from, uh, from stars or from, uh, from AGN, and a plethora of different uh, astrophysical processes. In the last years, this, this field has done huge leaps, so now it is possible to create realistic galaxies uh, with realistic colors and also uh, chemical abundances are uh, resembling more and more what we observe in the real universe. But despite all these very important steps forward, the simulations has also severe shortcomings. They are very much computationally expensive, so the, the box we can simulate are, uh, are much smaller with respect to, to the gravity-only counterpart. It's very difficult to calibrate the simulations. Typically, they are calibrated against some observables at redshift zero, but even if you calibrate, for instance, uh, your simulation with the luminosity function at redshift zero, it's not straightforward that other observables or, or the other redshift will be in agreement with observations. And actually, many times, this is not true, indeed. They are difficult to converge numerically because of the um, intrinsic baryonic feedback uh, scale. So baryonic physics uh, is very important at small scales. They are typically the ones that are not resolved by low resolution. So we go to higher and higher resolution, you get typically that your simulation is not converged. And since baryonic effects couple uh, small and large scales, for instance, when you have accretion onto a supermassive black hole, this is a parsec scale physical process, but can affect a megaparsec scale. And then you also want to resolve at the same time the large scale inflow at uh, hundreds of megaparsec scales. So this is a huge dynamical scale that currently is not feasible to simulate coherently. So what this astronomical simulation implements are subcrit prescription. These are just a, a numerical formulation ad hoc that you put by hand to basically model the small, small case physics, which is not accurately uh, simulated, but just put by hand in, in these simulations. And this subcrit prescription must be, of course, calibrated and must be tested against observations. And so these astronomical simulations are currently the most complex modeling we can have for both dark matter and baryons, but still baryonic effects are uh, quite poorly unknown, and, uh, and so the simulation must be tested and uh, taken with a pinch of salt in their predictions. But how baryonic effects can impact what we actually observe uh, in the sky and uh, how they impact our cosmological analysis? So their main impact is uh, through weak gravitational lensing. So let's consider this picture when we observe far galaxies, so far background galaxies. We can assume that their shape, the orientation of their shape in the sky is random. So they are randomly oriented in the sky. And when the light from these galaxies travels toward us, it goes through the large scale structure and it's going to feel the gravitational potential of the cosmic web. And this gravitational potential will bend the light of this galaxy and introduce an apparent correlation in the shape of these galaxies. So we will observe in the end that the, the shape of this galaxy will be correlated with the integral of the matter field of the cosmic web that is intervening between the galaxies and us. So this is shown in the, in the equation in the bottom. So the, the correlation of the shape of this galaxy is going to be equal to the integral in the commuting distance or the redshift on some geometrical lensing kernel time the matter power spectrum of the cosmic web at a given scale and at a given redshift. So in this graphic, I'm showing this correlation function, this time in real space. So the correlation of these galaxies in the y-axis and the x-axis, we have the separation in angle. This is uh, as measured by the Dark Energy Survey in year 3, so 2022, in a specific redshift bin. And actually, as you can see, in this, uh, in this measurement, we can find two different regions, the gray region and the white region. Actually, the white region is what the Dark Energy Survey model for their cosmological analysis, but the gray region is not modeled. The gray region is not modeled because these baryonic effects that are intervening in the cosmic web are uh, currently poorly understood, so they could potentially bias our cosmological parameters. They enter in the question, as you can see, from in the matter power spectrum. And therefore, a lot of data that we actually have, and it's a good data, is not used just because uh, a limitation of our modeling. So this is a problem uh, 
for all the, the stage three, so the current uh, weak lensing service. And um, we need some kind of modeling for this bionic physics in order to push our uh, cosmological analysis towards smaller scales and, and get better cosmological uh, inference. So what these hydrodynamical simulations predict for the effects in the matter power spectrum? This is a very famous plot by Norelisa Kisari in 2019 that show different prediction of, of hydrodynamical simulation in the matter power spectrum. So in particular it shows the ratio between the matter power spectrum in, uh, in the hydrodynamical simulation over the matter power spectrum in a gravity only counterpart. So like it's the uh, same uh, simulation but uh, switching off the variance, just gravity only. And as you can see the prediction of the different hydrodynamical simulation it's, it's quite different, so you can get at 50% uh, and more uh, in the matter power spectrum. So this is in comparison with the 1% difference in the, in the gravity only counterpart, it's, it's quite a lot. And we believe this different prediction comes from the different calibration of this hydrodynamical simulation and the different subgrid prescription. In particular, there has been a work by Marcel Van Dalen and others in 2020 that show that the suppression in the matter power spectrum caused by baryons that is found in, uh, in many hydrodynamical simulations is quite tightly correlated with the amount of baryons that we can measure inside halos of 10 to the 14 solar masses. So here you see this correlation in differ at different scales in the matter power spectrum from K0.5 to K1 inverse megaparsec time h. And as you can see, most of the simulations that, that are uh, taken into account follow this uh, nice trend, except Illustris at small scales. Uh, Illustris is one of the simulations with the uh, highest feedback, so larger suppression in the matter power spectrum. But this picture suggests us that, uh, that the more gas is blown from, uh, from the halos by, by agent feedback, by supernovae feedback, by whatever baryonic feedback, the more suppressed is the matter power spectrum. And there is this nice trend that, that has been found. But the matter power spectrum is not the only statistics that, uh, that is affected by baryons. Also, if you go to higher order, for instance, in the matter by spectrum, has been shown by, by Foreman and others in 2020, that you have very different prediction in the matter by spectrum. And same goes for the halo mass function. And you can see here in the halo mass function that, uh, for instance, the Eagle simulation predict a 20% suppression at the low end of the halo mass function, whereas the elastic simulation predict basically the opposite trend when it has a 20% suppression at, at the high end of the halo mass function. And so this can affect in different way the, the cluster counts prediction for cosmology. And then we have uh, in the bottom panels the weak lensing convergence statistics, for instance, the probability distribution function or the convergence peaks, but we can do the same thing also for the minima. And you see like different hydrodynamical simulation also here predict different impact in this kind of statistics. But even like uh, changing hydrodynamical simulation and check the different, uh, different impact, we can assess and uh, we can forecast what, what, are, what is the, the expected impact of these baryons in, uh, in the next generation service. So stage four service such as Euclid, such, such as LSST. So these service will be wider and deeper than with respect to the stage three and are designed to achieve a 1% accuracy in, uh, in the dark energy equation of state. So in the, in the weak lensing power spectrum, the peak sensitivities is expected to be between scales 1 and 7 uh, inverse megaparsecs. So these are very nonlinear scales. We expect that the baryonic uh, impact is, uh, is quite strong. And indeed, in uh, several works, for instance, in this Schneider and Lawler's work in 2020, it has been shown that if we ignore baryons, we will bias our cosmology. Here we, we show only the omega matter sigma 8 plane. And we see that if you ignore baryons, we get these uh, black contours. There is five sigma away from the truth, there is the black cross. And if we use uh, techniques such as, uh, as the dark energy survey one, so we remove all the small scales that we believe are affected by baryons, we will uh, lose a lot of uh, our constraining power. We would get these gray uh, contours. So a much better strategy would be to try to model these baryons and marginalize over them and that would be, we'll get the red contours. 
So it's, it's unbiased and the constraints are much stronger with respect to, to the gray one. And finally, if we would know perfectly the baryonic effects, we would get the, the blue contours. So baryonic effects cannot be ignored in stage 4 surveys. Uh, we cannot use directly adrenomical simulation because we've seen the different prediction for the matter power spectrum because of the resolution, because of the subgrid prescription, because of the um, different calibrations. So the question is how do we model these baryonic effects for, for this kind of analysis? We can actually found four different families of methods that we can apply to model baryons. And the first is the principal component analysis. So in this method, we, we just take a bunch of adrenomical simulations and check their prediction for the matter power spectrum and decompose them in principal components. And then we can marginalize over these different components in our cosmological analysis. And then it, it has been shown by, for instance, Seifler or Wang, that just removing uh, the first four or five principal components is enough to, to get unbiased cosmology constraints. But these actually assume that one of your simulation at least is quite realistic and can reproduce correctly what baryonic effects are in the real universe. Another family of models is the HALO model. So these have been explored by, by many groups. And the main technique is to change the traditional gravity-only HALO model in order to take into account of baryons. This can be done just effectively by changing, for instance, the concentration of the HALOs, or can be done more in a more physically motivated manner. For instance, adding different density profile in the one HALO term for the different baryonic uh, baryonic components, for instance, a galaxy density profile or a gas density profile. And there is then the machine learning kind of techniques. So typically this, these techniques try to learn the mapping between gravity only and hydrodynamical counterparts. So these are quite powerful techniques because they can work even at a field level, even though the shortcoming is that these hydrodynamical simulations are very very much computationally expensive. So typically the training set for this uh, kind of techniques are either a small training set or the box size of this training set is, is small. And then uh, you would like to explore different adronomical models and different adronomical parameters. And, uh, and you, would, you would need that the real universe is within your training set to, to get unbiased cosmological parameters. Finally, we have hybrid techniques. So these techniques typically take as a starting point uh, gravity-only and body simulations and then try to modify them, for instance, displacing the particles inside the simulation in order to take into account uh, the baryonic effects. So within these methods, we have, for instance, the baryonification or the gradient descendant, descendant method of the baryon pesting algorithm. They are all techniques which, which try to, to model these, uh, these effects in a more data-driven way, let's say. Now I'm going to focus uh, specifically on uh, one of these methods, so the baryon correction model, which has been uh, originally um, proposed by Aurel Schneider and Romain Tessier in 2015. But I'm going to explain in the details a re-implementation that I did with my collaborators in 2019. So the baryonic correction model takes in post-processing gravity only and body simulations. So like you run your, your gravity only simulation and afterward you put baryons on top of it. So before baryonification, your halos will be like just, uh, just matter, just gravity only, for instance. One example can be the one in the left panel. But after the baryonification, you will displace your particles. You will tag your particles with different components, so you will have different density profiles as in the right. So how this, does this work? So we, we're going to have to analytically find different baryonic components, different uh, density profiles. So first we have to impose mass conservation, so we will have the mass of the dark matter, the fraction uh, of the total mass in dark matter, gas and stars will sum up to one, of course. So we have the, the fraction dark matter is going to be just given by the cosmic baryon fraction, so 1 minus omega baryon over omega matter. And we left that the uh, fraction in stars is going to be given by abundance matching, where you just assign the most massive galaxies to the most massive halos. And this is going to uh, have a shape as, as the one written here, where M1 is a uh, free parameters of the, of the model, 
and as you can see like in this upper panel how the fraction starts over the halo mass change when you change m1 so we're changing this relative fraction between stars and dark matter and then we have uh, the gas fractions so we have two different components in the gas the gas that stays in the halos is gravitational bound and is in thermal equilibrium uh, the fraction has this shape where we have the like, cosmic baryon fraction minus the fraction of stars over this 1 plus mc over m200 and the power of beta so this mc is another three parameters and basically is the characteristic halo mass for which half of the gas is depleted for agent feedback and in this bottom panel we see like the effect of varying this mc so like for higher and higher mc we have that uh, more and more massive halos will uh, will lose half of the gas and we have also this beta the beta that change the tilt of this uh, relation so we have here three these different free parameters once we have the fractions in mass we have to to find a, a fo functional form for the density profiles so we have the dark matter we will use just an avaro franke white plus a quasi-diabatic relaxation that is given by the back reaction of the baryons on the dark matter. And I'm not going to speak about this, but if you want more details, you can find it in the paper, or in the paper of Rico and others, 2021. And then we have the stars that are, uh, that are modeled as a power law plus a cutoff. And uh, most importantly, the gas. Uh, we will separate also in this case the gas that is bound in halos from the one that is ejected. The bound gas is, um, is this characteristic shape with a double, double power law uh, where we have three different free parameters. So the, the radius at which the, the slope change in the inner part of the profile and in the outer part of the profile and the slope of the inner part of the profile. So in this uh, upper panel, we see like uh, it's changing the scale of the slope. As uh, you see, as the band gas get uh, flatter or get more uh, more steep in the profile, and uh, the ejected uh, gas from halos is a constant density profile uh, with a cutoff, and this cutoff is regulated by these eta parameters. So the larger is the eta parameter, the farther goes the gas from the halo center. So the stronger is the agent feedback, basically. So we have here four more free parameters in our model. And once we have our uh, halo density profiles, so like we have the different profiles, we can sum them up to have um, a final baryonic corrected density profiles. And in this case, we can integrate it and compare it with the initial uh, matter profile from our embody simulations. So once we have these two different profiles, mass profiles, we can invert them. And once we invert them, we find the radial displacement of the particles. So this displacement basically tells us how we should move the particles in our halos to correct for these bionic effects. And in displacement, we can find three different regimes. So close to the halo boundaries, we have this long range displacement where the particle is going to be expelled from the halo in a long range. Then uh, in uh, most of the halos, we are going to have a relaxation given by the, the gas. So the halo is going to expand a bit. Whereas in the inner part, we have a negative displacement. This means that the particles are going to go toward the halo center. And this is because of the, of the galaxy formation that is much more dense with respect to the dark matter only profile. And once we apply this displacement, we can also tag the particles to belong to each of these components. So in the end, we have different fields of baryonic and dark matter components. So here we can see, for instance, a baryonified simulation how it looks. So we have uh, the dark matter field uh, in the left, the bound gas in the upper right, the ejected gas that trace better, you see, like the, the cosmic web, because it's, it's ejected from the halos, and the, finally the galaxy, uh, the galaxy field. We can also compute what's the relative impact of these components in the matter power spectrum. And this is the, the impact of each of these components in the total matter power spectrum. The orange line here is the total baryonic effects in these uh, particular astrophysical scenarios. And as you can see, the dominant component here is ejected gas. So this is basically uh, in agreement with found with also a dynamical simulation is the more gas you eject 
from the halos, the more suppression you will have in the matter power spectrum. And you can get more quantitative in this, so you, we can vary systematically all the three parameters in our baryon correction model and see what's the impact in the clustering. So here we see the, the impact in both the power spectrum in the first row and in the bus spectrum in the second row. As you can see, if we change the AGN range, so the zeta parameters that change how far the gas go from the halo boundaries, we see that the suppression in the, in the power spectrum go to larger and larger scales. Or if we change this MC, that is the quantity of gas that remains in halo, or the gas that is pushed in, uh, from halos, we see that this acts as an amplitude of the overall uh, suppression in the matter power spectrum. And this is also uh, in agreement with what found in Van Dalin with other amical simulations. And then we have also all the other, other parameters that impact in different way the shape or the, or the scales of this matter power spectrum. So we can test this simple model with uh, much more complex models, for instance, hydronomical simulations. And here uh, I'm showing the fit to density profiles from stars and from gas of elastic TNG hydronomical simulation. So here I'm showing just one hello mass beam, but the exercise involved also more uh, hello mass beams. And as you can see, the baryon correction model can fit in an accurate way both the gas and the star profiles from the TNG simulation. We can also try to fit the clustering, so the power spectrum and also the bispectrum of the simulations. I am showing at redshift zero how the, the model perform. And you see that the power spectrum can be recovered at a 1% level in all these simulations. And uh, if we fit the power spectrum and the bi spectrum uh, at the same time, we can recover it at a 3% level. So this model is, uh, is very accurate. And uh, it's important also to, to study the, the genesis between cosmology and astrophysics. And this is, can be easily done with the baryon correction model. So in this panel, I'm showing uh, the impact of changing dramatically the, each of these cosmological parameters in four different astrophysical scenarios. So an eagle-like, an illustrious TNG-like, a Bahamas-like, and an illustrious like And as you can see, the most of the impact in the cosmology parameters is given by omega matter and omega baryons, and especially the fraction of omega baryon over omega matter, so the cosmic baryon fraction. So this is given simply because like, when we change this, uh, this fraction, we will have more baryons that are available to be turned in galaxies or rejected by, by gas. And we have still residual uh, dependencies in, um, in sigma 8, in the amplitude of the fluctuations, or uh, in the Hubble constant, or uh, in NS, that is the tilt of the primordial power spectrum. And of course, this A is just the redshift. So this baryon correction model is also dependent on the redshift somehow. The baryon correction model relies on uh, gravity only simulations. And, and we know that plugging in numerical simulation in our cosmological analysis is basically unfeasible because these simulations typically are very large. So just to read the particle of, of one simulation can take one minute. And in typical cosmological analysis with, co with uh, when running uh, Monte Carlo Markov chains, we take typically 100,000 100, evaluation of our model. This means that we would need months to run our cosmological analysis. So one way to speed up this process is to use uh, the so-called emulators. These emulators are interpolators of a costly function in a hyperparameter space. So in this case, I'm, I'm presenting uh, the BACUEMU, which is a project uh, that, that we, we are developing with Raul Angulo, Matteo Zennaro, and others collaborators in uh, the Donosti International Physics Center. So uh, this emulator works with, with uh, neural networks. We feed into the neural network our parameters. In this case, uh, we use seven baryonic parameters and eight cosmological parameters, included uh, massive neutrinos and uh, dynamical dark energies. And we make our neural network learn the dependencies uh, the, the mapping uh, from these parameters to the matter power spectrum. In particular, we train three different networks for three different components of the matter power spectrum. The linear component, which, uh, where we use the class Boltzmann solver, a nonlinear boost, which is learning the, the ratio between the nonlinear component and the linear component. 
So we are using a uh, numerical simulation w with cosmology that is rescaled through cosmologic scaling uh, algorithm. And then we are adding also the, the bionic suppression uh, with the bionic correction model that I've presented before. And this kind of emulation is very accurate. So the typical error in this, uh, in this, in this emulation is 1%. And this is typically subdominant with respect to other source of errors. And uh, the, the evaluation of the model is very fast, can take just one millisecond. So this analysis would go from, the, from months to just a few minutes. So this is a really game changer in this kind of, of analysis. And actually all the back uh, package is publicly available at this link. So I invite you to, to download the emulators and play it with them. And once you have this emulator, you can go and do different uh, exercises. For instance, here I'm showing the fit to the power spectrum of um, of different anatomical simulation collected by Marcel Van Dalin and others. Uh, so at the time there were seven, 74 hydrodynamical simulation in the library. I think now it's 100 or something like that. And we are fitting with our uh, emulator all these anatomical power spectra and we find that we can fit them at 1% level, all of them. And we try to strip down our models to have lower parameters. Here we show three parameters and with one parameter and as you can see, even with just one parameter, we can still recover most of the hydrodynamical simulation matter power spectrum at a percent level. And even the most extreme that are basically ruled out already from, from the data is just uh, 5%. This seems to work well even with just one parameter. It's interesting also to see if the baryon correction model can reproduce the fitting function found with hydrodynamical simulation by Marcel Van Dalin and others in 2020. Here I'm showing in the y-axis the suppression in the matter power spectrum given by baryons, and in the x-axis the baryon fraction inside the halos of 10 to the, 10 to the 14 solar masses. And here in the, the black dashed lines is, is the fitting function found by Van Dalin. And these three different panels show the, our prediction with the baryon correction model with three free parameters, two free parameters, and one free parameters. So let's focus before in the one free parameter case, this free parameters is MC, so the quantity of gas that stay in ELOS, right? And we see if we just vary these parameters, we don't have enough degree of freedom at the, at the lower baryon fraction, or like the, the suppression is a bit underestimated. But if we add another free parameters, which is eta, is the, the AGN range, basically. So we vary both the quantity of gas inside ELOS and the range at which is uh, pushed away from the halos. And in this case, you see like this fitting function is nicely recovered in basically all the cases. If we add another three parameters, which is a beta, is, is the slope in the, in the gas fraction halo masses relation. And in this case, we have even more uh, degree of freedom with respect to the adrenomical simulation. So like at the strongest feedback, we'll see that uh, the baryon correction model can, can go away from this, uh, this relation. Okay, so now we have uh, seen in the, in the details uh, how the baryon correction model uh, is built and um, how it has been tested against adrenomical simulations. But in the next few slides, I want to, uh, to show you how we can inform it with uh, observations and how this can help us in the cosmological analysis. So as we have seen, the baryon correction model free parameters are directly related with, uh, with observables. For instance, they they parameterize the gas fraction and stellar fraction that we can observe directly with X-ray data or with uh, optical data from clusters. So here we show a collection of this uh, uh, X-ray data for the gas fraction and, uh, and stellar fraction from, uh, from optical surveys. And in the right panel, a kinetic sunel seldovich profile. So in all these three cases, the color lines are, are given by different baryonic correction models set with different free parameters. And as you can see, the data point of the constraining power to tight uh, the, the baryonic priors when compared against observations. So this kind of exercise has been uh, carried on uh, by Aurel Schneider and others in 2022. They collect data from Cosmic Shear, KIDS 1000, X-ray data and uh, kinetic Sunaris Eldovich from Hakt and Planck, and they 
jointly constrain the uh, baryon correction model free parameters uh, with this data. So this baryon correction model is slightly different with respect to the one I, I described before. It is based on the algorithm by Schneider and others 2020. The parameterization is a bit different, like bit, uh, the, the parameters have slightly different meaning, but the spirit of the model is, uh, is very similar and actually how it works is very similar too. And so they constrain the seven baryon correction model parameters, like here I'm showing just two, mu and uh, logarithm of MC. And as you can see, if they use just weak lensing data from, uh, from KITS 1000, this constraint, the, the parameters are not constrained, whereas if they join all the three data set, they have uh, nice constraints in, uh, in both of these parameters. And these constraints on the baryon correction model can be turned in a prediction on the matter power spectrum suppression. So if they use, also in this case, if they use only weak lensing data in the first panel here, they don't, they don't have much constraint in power in the, in the suppression of the matter power spectrum. But if we add on top of it X-ray data, you see that, that the constraining power is enough to to rule out a two sigma uh, weak constraints, for instance, the one of Eagle or Horizon AGN or uh, Elasticity NG. And if you add on top of it also uh, kinetic Sunaris Eldovich, you have even a stronger feedback that is preferred. So this is at the level of uh, hydronomical simulations such as Cosmo Owls in the stronger feedback scenario. So this analysis points toward relatively strong feedback. I want to point out also the emulator they use in this analysis is the BCMU. It's an emulator of the model of Schneider and others in 2020, which is built with Gaussian process by Sambit Giri and Aurel Schneider in 2021. Also, this is uh, freely available. I invite you to download it, th this, uh, this link. And, um, and actually, a similar analysis has been carried on by Angela Chen, myself, Dragon Uther, Raul Angulo, and all the DS collaboration. Uh, the paper is out on archive just a few weeks uh, ago. And um, in this case, we, we used uh, Dark Energy Survey data, year three data. And actually, we used just the small scales that has been thrown away by the main analysis. So, uh, the cosmology that we used uh, is, is, um, is the main three times two point analysis that has been done with the large scales. And we use just the small scales to constrain bionic effects. So um, in the right panel, you see the constraints we found in the logarithm of, uh, of MC. So this is the characteristic LO mass, which lose half of, the, of its gas by, by bionic effects. So here we, we find the value of, the, of MC of 10 to the 14 solar masses, more or less. So by our own analysis, we would expect hell of 10 to the 14 solar masses to lose half of their gas. But is this compatible with what we observe, for instance, uh, with X-ray data? This is what we find in the left panel. So the gray band is, is our prediction with cosmic shear analysis of what is the gas fraction inside HELOS and overplot the actual observation from X-ray data. And as you can see, these uh, are, uh, are nicely compatible. And then we can also predict what is the suppression we expect in the matter power spectrum and compare it with the uh, current dynamical simulations. And uh, we found actually a milder feedback with respect to Schneider and others. So this feedback is roughly in agreement with Owls or Bahamas. So uh, the main point of the baryon correction model is that we can uh, take advantage of, uh, of the knowledge we have about gravity so through M-body simulation, which, which are robust, which we deeply understand, and uh, perturb them to, to get these bionic effects but these effects are informed directly by observations. And then we can test it also with a more complex model, such as hydronomical simulations. And before concluding, I just want to throw some ideas for the live discussion about how to maximize the joint constraints of cosmology and astrophysics that we can uh, get from, uh, from next generation surveys. So I think we have uh, two clear paths that we can follow. One is to go to higher order statistics. We could use, for instance, the weak lensing convergence peaks, minima, or probability distribution function, or get to the bispectrum or some integrated flavor of the bispectrum, or use some, some kind of filtering or functional form, for instance, Minkowski functionals or wavelets, or try to model 
the cosmology and baryonic physics at the field level. And another path that we can do is to try to cross-correlate different observations. So a natural uh, cross-correlation that we can model is the thermal tsunami cell dough which we claim in cross-correlation. This signal has already been detected by several groups and actually also some attempt of modeling it has been done with the, with the HALO model, with the HN code by Alex Mead and in a work by Tilman Trosten and others. So these are very promising steps toward uh, a full analysis of these cross-correlations. But in all these cases, we need uh, some, uh, some robust and flexible modeling of, uh, of both cosmology and, and baryons at the same time. Uh, I believe that baryonification can be used for all these cases, but we need to, to test them against adrenomical simulations, and, and uh, not in all these cases has been done. For cross-correlation, we could uh, actually try to model not only the density field, but also the temperature field in the same spirit as the, as the baryon pesting algorithm by Kenosato and, uh, and the Suke Nagai. And probably like going to a higher order and, uh, and join different observables is the way we can tighter this, the baryonic correction priors and get uh, more of, um, of cosmology out of our quick lensing uh, service. So in summary, uh, I hope I convince you that baryonic physics should not uh, be treated as a simple nuisance for our cosmological analysis. Baryonic processes are, uh, are interesting per se, and uh, actually only understanding better uh, baryonic processes, we can um, get stronger constraints out of our uh, next generation service. We have understood that dynamical simulation should not be trusted at face value, but they are very important if we want to calibrate our, uh, our modeling and actually we should select carefully which hydrodynamical simulation to, to trust because they, they need to, to be calibrated against relevant observable for our analysis. And in this case, relevant observable can be gas stellar fractions in ELOS. And almost none of these hydrodynamical simulations have been, have been calibrated against this observable, with the rare exception, for instance, the Bahama suite of, uh, of simulations. And, um, Ultimately, we would need a physically motivated model, which is accurate, which is fast, which is flexible enough to encompass the real universe among its, its possibilities. And we need, we need it to be predictive, we need it to, to be able to model different observ observable at the same time, to get the cross-correlations, to, to beat systematics, and to, and to be able to, to constrain at the same time both cosmology and astrophysical, and astrophysical parameters parameters from different data set. And I believe that barinification is a very good candidate for these tasks. And I'd like to thank you and I look forward to the, the live discussion with all of you. Thanks.